So thank you, uh, and thank you for everybody for joining us here tonight. I think this is going to be a really interesting panel. Uh, as you probably know, it's titled Charlottesville Perspectives on the Origins and Implications of White Nationalism in the U.S. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, this is part of a series called Reaffirming University Values that the provost, Richard Locke, and I started last year. And in a letter to the Brown community last year announcing the series, the provost stated the following that I want to repeat here so you get the idea. Through a series of lectures and workshops, we will consider how to cultivate an environment in which we, as a community, can discuss conflicting values and controversial issues in constructive and engaging ways. So last year, for those of you who, who weren't here, uh, we talked about many different things. We, we had lectures on free speech on campus, uh, on civil disobedience, science denial, Islamophobia, uh, refugee policy, and a number of other issues. And later this semester, we will hear from Columbia University Professor Mark Lilla and several Brown faculty members, uh, Charles Larmore and Purna Singh on identity liberalism. So today, the topic is the set of issues that were raised by the Charlottesville incident. And as I said yesterday at convocation, my immediate reaction to Charlottesville was anger and horror, uh, followed by the realization that I needed to learn more about the historical and political context that generated that really dreadful weekend. Unfortunately, as we all know, hate groups and racialized violence are not new phenomenon. And you know, maybe it's the optimist in me speaking, but I, I thought after Charlottesville that maybe perhaps this was the incident that might be the watershed moment that would provoke a deep examination of white nationalism in America. Maybe, maybe. Uh, and it, it may not happen in the rest of the country, but it might as well happen right here at Brown. And, and I hope that we can begin to do this today. Now, what this panel isn't on, we are not here to talk about the specifics of what happened that day, that weekend. We are not here to talk about the political response the following week. That could come up in Q&A, and that's fine if you want to, but that's not what we've asked the panelists to focus on. Instead, what we asked them to do was to think about and talk about the more nuanced and contextualized um, issues around Charlottesville so that we can understand better what happened, why it happened, and, and what we can do about it going forward. I, I know that I have many, many questions, and I'm sure many of you do too. W when I think about that weekend, I think about things like you know, why are Confederate statues and memorials still so prominent in this country, in the South? And why are they now, now, as opposed to other times, at the center of conflict? Uh, what was the meaning of these memorials to groups when they were erected? How do they impact people who live with them, walk by them, sit near them every day? What are the historical forces that fuel anti-black, anti-immigrant, anti-Jewish, anti-Muslim sentiments that we see coming out of white nationalism? And what role has the state played, perhaps, in legitimating violence based on race, religion, immigration status, and other things? And what does Charlottesville say about how our society is structured and what we can do to change it? I know that this is one short panel, and these are many, many very big questions, and I know that there are more out there, and we will only be able to scratch the surface here. What I hope, though, is that this is the beginning of a set of conversations that will take place throughout the year, and also to give all of you, especially students, just a sense of the types of issues and the types of scholarship that our faculty are working on here at Brown. So what we've done, we've invited several Brown faculty members from a range of areas of scholarship to speak about these issues. Uh, each of them has exactly seven minutes each to give a short talk on what they think people most need to know coming out of Charlottesville. And then we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, not to cut into the time, I'm not going to give the typical long biographical sketch of each person. They're all Brown faculty members, and you can read about them all online. Hopefully, you'll be taking their courses. And I'll, I'll just say a few words about them now in the order in which they'll speak. 
Uh, the first is Professor Bonnie Honig. They're seated uh, from, from right to left. Uh, she's the Nancy Duke Lewis Professor in the Departments of Modern Culture and Media and Political Science. She's currently serving as the Interim Director of the Pembroke Center. Uh, I asked her to do this. She told me she couldn't, she had to leave early. She'll try to come back later, but what she has to say is important enough that I really wanted her here, so I'm glad she could do it. Uh, next to Bonnie is Professor Michael Vorenberg. He's Associate Professor of History. Uh, I want to note that he was actually a member of Brown's Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice that produced the report that I hope all of you have taken some time to look at. Uh, next is Professor Emily Owens. Uh, she is Assistant Professor of History and a Faculty Fellow at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Then Professor Monica Munoz Martinez. Uh, she is the Stanley J. Berenstein Assistant Professor of American Studies and Ethnic Studies and a faculty fellow with the John Nicholas Brown Center for the Public Humanities. Uh, finally, we, not finally, but next on this bench, we have Professor Maud Mandel. She's Professor of History and Judaic Studies and Dean of the College. Professor John Tomasi, he's the Romeo Elton Professor of Natural Theology and Professor of Political Science and Director of the Political Theory Project. You're getting the idea that people at Brown often wear many hats. Uh, professor Tricia Rose, uh, the Chancellor's Professor of Africana Studies and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. So uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists. Hi, I have a PowerPoint um, that lets me say more faster. Um, so uh, it's your first week. You guys just got here mostly, and uh, you see that we're hitting the ground running. Um, I want to talk to you today about affect, citizenship in the DACA inclusive sense of political belonging and public things. By affect, I mean things like anger, care, concern. By citizenship, I mean working together to build power and equality in a democracy. By public things, I mean the furniture of democratic life. The contested statues of Civil War heroes in the South are not public things. Many were installed by private groups like the United Daughters of the Confederacy with no public debate, vote, or accountability. Such groups colonize public space with objects that send a message about who counts as the public, whose history gets commemorated, who's in charge. Claiming public space for themselves was also the aim of the Unite the Right organizers in Virginia, who noted the importance of coming out, being seen, and working together in real life. We don't have the camaraderie, one said. We don't have the trust level that our rivals do, and that camaraderie and trust is built up through our activism. Images from Charlottesville bore him out, depicting not only the anger, militant and frightening, that I expected to see, but also startling scenes of care and mutual aid. In one, a man poured milk over another's face to counter the effects of mace, then gently tilted his fellow Nazi's chin in his hand and asked, is that better? Watching these men enjoy care and attention in public, listening to them claim camaraderie, I began to see them as longing for citizenship. In the last half century, US citizenship has been thinned out, our sense of shared, overlapping, contending, and conflicting purpose replaced by law, neutral procedure, and the importance of listening to all sides. These latter commitments may express admirable virtues, like tolerance and fairness, but they can also serve the proceduralism, the neutrality, as a bright neon sign of values vacancy that advertises the devitalization of public life. Chanting, Jews will not replace us, the men at that march united around horrifying values rather than none. Gathered together in public, they created conditions for mutual care rather than isolation. They were coming out, they said, showing up, part of a larger whole, having a great time. They wanted to see and be seen in public. Ironically, the public they want to access now is one that whites have abandoned over the last few decades. Take, for example, public pools. They were once a white middle-class delight, well supported by public funds. After they were integrated, though, suddenly private pools became popular. The same with public schools. After integration or desegregation often comes white disinvestment and abandonment of the public thing. Going private is better. Here, neoliberalism, which prefers privatization for its own reasons, aligns with white supremacy, which wants control. 
decades after abandoning rather than integrating public life, emboldened by a president and a party that coddle rather than condemn them, white supremacists now want the public back, but without the divisions and conflicts that vivify public life. They want the public without the politics. That is the dangerous dream of every ethno-nationalist, as we know from the political theorist Hannah Arendt, a German Jewish refugee who talked about our obligation to share the world with others. For Arendt, political action means joining with others across difference, and it's fulfilling and exciting, erecting or toppling statues, staging theater, mounting protests, running for office, joining groups, are expressions of care and concern for a common world. Without them, we're at risk. Arendt drew on her experience in 1930s Germany. She saw how the Nazis made gains because people acquiesced. Many were afraid or busy. They didn't want to be political, and soon it was too late. Arendt's experience is echoed in the words of a Charlottesville activist today. There's a Jewish story about a great European rabbi of remarkable faith. The man went to sleep every night with his shoes arranged just so by his bed. Why, his students asked, do you do that? What's with the shoes? He wanted to be ready, the rabbi said, in case the Messiah turned up in the middle of the night. Arendt wants us to cultivate that kind of readiness for politics. She was always on the alert for any sign that the ball had been dropped. Take the Declaration of Independence, drafted by Jefferson, UVA's founder. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Now we know about the ironies of this lofty phrase authored by a slaveholder and aimed only at propertied white males, but Arendt, who was sometimes deaf to the nuances of racial politics, noticed something else. Why say both that we hold these truths and that they're self-evident? Which is it? Either the truth is self-evident, in which case we don't need to hold it, or we hold it, in which case it is not self-evident. Arendt argued that Jefferson made a mistake when he reached for the certainty of self-evidence. All men are created equal is a political claim, and it depends on us holding it. We hold means we promise, we care, we're in it together as equals. Jefferson got that part right. She said, so did Du Bois, Baldwin, Rustin, and many more. They all invite us to become a we, a community that holds ourselves together. But building a community is kind of like learning a new dance. At first, we're clumsy and step on each other's toes. We need not to get too mad about that when that happens. And we need time to learn the steps and practice them. We practice on the streets and at university, and that is why those men marched at a university. Because universities are places of holding without self-evident guarantees. Our commitment is to think, to think critically about the obvious, aspirationally about the fixed, historically about the settled. We are not liberal, ideological, or partisan. We do not indoctrinate. We seek understanding, and we do not teach both sides, because there are never only two sides. Those people who marched on UVA see the university as a battlefield. Recently, white supremacists tried to get a classicist fired for daring to say that all those ancient white marble statues that we admire were originally painted in bright colors. Historically, she said, a cult of whiteness had sprung up around the statues, but it rested on an error. She got death threats. We need university administrators, I'm glad you're here. We need university administrators to help secure the conditions that underwrite the university's mission. These conditions are not mere and more freedom in a neutral zone. It is not enough to say we don't agree with her views, but we defend her right to say it. That's pretty good, though. I'll take that, but it's even better to be ready, shoes by the bed ready, to say, we reject the drive-by efforts of unauthorized parties with their own partisan agendas to target our community, and we will not respond to them. That is not our mission. This is the last thing I'm going to say. Five days after the Charlottesville violence, the UVA students reclaimed their space. To the men who chanted on their campus, you will not replace us, UVA students gathered together and replied, we replaced you. It was awesome. But <laughs> but there's a lot more work to do and a lot more dancing ahead. With that in mind, I leave you with some words from James Baldwin. If you haven't been reading him already, it's a great place to start. Thank you. I want to thank 
President Paxson and uh, the Provost, uh, Rick Locke, for organizing this event and also Marissa Quinn for handling the, the uh, logistics so quickly. This could not have been easy. So as some of you know, I'm Michael Vornberg and I'm a member of the History Department here. And I've had a number of roles at Brown, but there are two that connect uh, to some of the issues that we're talking about tonight. Uh, first and probably foremost, I'm a historian of the American Civil War and Reconstruction. I teach a course on that subject here. It's often a very large course. Uh, why is it a large course is kind of an interesting question. It's a large course in most places it's taught. The Civil War has a way of gripping people's imagination, of reminding people that, as one of William Faulkner's characters said, a character fixated on the war, that the past is not dead, it's not even past. On the surface, at least, and maybe only on the surface, the events at Charlottesville were connected to the Civil War, specifically to a statue of Robert E. Lee, the most revered of the Confederate generals in the South. Should the statue stay? Should it go? Should it somehow be put in a better historical context? Uh, on that issue, I would uh, refer you to the recent easily available statement of the American Historical Association made about such statues and also about the Confederate flag, a flag, by the way, which was never the flag of the Confederacy, but rather came into popular use only as a banner of white supremacy in the uh, 100 years after the Civil War as a counter reaction to the Civil Rights Movement. The American Historical Association in a statement reminds us that memorials to the Confederacy were intended in part, I would say in large part, to obscure the terrorism required to overthrow Reconstruction and to intimidate African Americans politically and isolate them from the mainstream of public life. Events in Charlottesville and elsewhere indicate that these symbols of white supremacy are still being invoked for the same purposes. I'll add to that, President Paxson asked a good question, or a number of good questions about why are these statues, how they come to be, and what happened to them. I would just point out that the movement to take such statues down, to put them in a museum, to put them in historical context, is not something that came after the election of 2016. It has really gained acceleration in the last few years, uh, also renaming of things. Why that is, I leave to uh, other panelists and maybe to the discussion. I think some of the reasons are rather obvious, but others maybe are worth exploring. As for Robert E. Lee, whether he deserves a statue, I don't think I want to waste your time too much on that. To those who would say that he does deserve a statue, that he was a great man, and that he was by incident only a slave owner, or someone who simply merely tolerated slavery, I could marshal much evidence against you. I'll mention just one thing, that when Lee's troops invaded Pennsylvania in 1863 in an invasion that would lead to the Battle of Gettysburg. While in southern Pennsylvania, his soldiers uh, engaged in what they jokingly, jokingly called a great slave hunt, in which they went into the southern Pennsylvania countryside, they seized free African Americans, and they enslaved them. A practice that technically then, as now, is regarded as a violation of the laws of war a war crime. But while I condemn Lee and, for that matter, the entire Confederate war effort, I am also aware of the danger that, in doing so, I risk drawing once again on what the poet and novelist Robert Penn Warren called the treasury of virtue. The southern-born Warren, writing at the centennial of the Civil War, used the treasury of virtue as the term to describe northerners who, merely because they were on the winning side, claimed moral perfection. Now, I am a child of New England, born in Boston not too long after Warren wrote his essay, and thus I know a lot about claims to moral perfection. But as a member of the Brown community, I should know better than to make such claims. Across the green from us, at the west entrance to Manning Chapel, there is a plaque honoring 21 Brown students and alumni who died for the Union in the Civil War. Those are just 21. There are others that we know about. There is no mention there of the 18 Brown students and alumni, the 18 we know about, that is, who died fighting for the Confederacy. As much as I wish to disavow the connection of those 18 or more to Brown, and thus to me, 
I cannot and must not do so. Which brings me to the second reason I might be here tonight, as President Paxson mentioned. It just happens I'm the only member here uh, on this stage that was a member of the Slavery and Justice Committee, the Steering Committee that President, then President Simmons created in 2003 and that issued its reports three years later. All of that material can be found on Brown's website. In President Simmons' charge to the committee, she issued words that our committee turned to again and again at moments of impasse or when we somehow lost our way. And I suggest that these words should guide Brown, that they do guide us in the difficult discussions that must take place ahead. And they remind us of the extraordinary opportunity and privilege of being at a place, especially this place, which invites rather than avoids such discussions. President Simmons charged us a wide range of complicated legal questions, moral issues, and historical controversies need to be examined rigorously and in detail. These are problems about which informed men and women of goodwill may ultimately disagree. However, the goal will not be to achieve a consensus, but to provide factual information and critical perspectives that will deepen our understanding. I want to be clear that what President Simmons articulated was not cold fact-finding or moral relativism. It was moral commitment without easy sanctimony. It was the moral certainty of Abraham Lincoln's 1862 message to Congress, which demanded an end to slavery, combined with that message's humility, humility, the vanishing commodity in political leadership today. We have a president, after all, who says that Lincoln was the only president more presidential than he. Humility that Lincoln showed by asking in that message, can we do better? And he answered that question with an extraordinary choice of a word. Can we do better? Yes. But we must first disenthrall ourselves. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank President Paxson um, for calling us together tonight and um, for in the last weeks being so vocal and so public about this university's commitment uh, to stand against racism, hatred, bigotry, and xenophobia, which I think is a real testament to this community and what we stand for. And also to thank my colleagues, um, who I'm so glad to sit among tonight. Um, like Professor Vornberg, I am interested in why and how the past appears in the present. I'm a historian of, sla of US slavery. Um, and, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about memory, but I'm also going to talk about violence. Through their call to unite the right, the folks who marched at Charlottesville some weeks ago brought attention to the ideological convergences of historically distinct institutions, the mid-19th century Confederate States of America, the 19th century foundation of white, the late 19th century foundation of white vigilante terrorism, and Germany's 20th century Third Reich and the Holocaust. Their particular obsession with protecting monuments of Confederate generals and their use of symbolism that evokes the Confederacy actually speaks volumes, as Professor Vorenberg noted, um, of the 20th century and its lifetime of, of white racism. But I also think it makes sense to take these guys at their word. When they mobilize the symbols and ideas of the Confederacy and the KKK, they're remembering and I think that's important to distinguish from historicizing, groups of people who enacted violence to preserve and later to try to reinstate slavery. When people at this moment say that we need to make this country great again, they are, as feminist theorist Claire Hemings might say, telling stories about the past. In this story they tell, some previous time both vague and specifically represented through, through specific symbols tied to slavery's legacy, this time that they invoke was a great time for white people and should inform a vision for the future. The people of this, this current movement invokes the historical members of the Confederacy and the early Ku Klux Klan were also themselves devotees of memory. If the contemporary movement makes heroes out of the soldiers and generals of the Confederacy and the founding members of white vigilante terrorist groups, then the heroes for actual Confederates and actual founding members of the KKK were slaveholders. Those 19th century white supremacists were very explicit. They thought slavery was great. They thought the antebellum period was a great time for white people. And they wanted the chance to be slaveholders. And many of them wanted that for the first time. 
In other words, multiple levels of memory were operating in Charlottesville, and the vector of layered memories leads straight back to slavery. Yet when you follow the trail back to the vision of slaveholders themselves, things start to fall apart. Because even as the institution of slavery was undeniably an expression of white supremacist ideology, the ideology itself was rather fragile. The violence that was so present was extremely real for the people who lived through it. And I'm going to talk about more about that in a minute. But in terms of the idea that there was some great time for white people that America needs to return to again, I think there's some room for clarification. What I mean to say is this. Slavery was always as bad for enslaved people, for free people of color, and for indigenous Americans as they said it was. And slavery was never as good for slaveholders or poor white people as they thought it was then, or as they seem to think it was now. Pro-slavery Southerners, particularly those writing in the last two decades before the Civil War, cultivated and nurtured a fantasy about the world around them. They convinced themselves that slavery was a positive good. They told themselves in their diaries and their accounting books that they themselves had grown bales and bales of cotton. They told themselves in pro-slavery publications and in public forums that enslavement civilized these wretched Africans, gave them language and God and virtue. They told themselves in the law that enslaved people were and could be at once both persons and property. Human and alive enough to toil, emotional enough to be afraid of punishment or to be able to have family bonds used against them, while at the same time thing enough, dead enough to be manipulated at will, to have no feelings of consequence at all. Slaveholders told themselves that if they were focused and they were careful and if they accounted for everything that happened on their plantations, that the system would flourish and that the black people who lived among them would be happy and docile and obedient and that they would love them. In that fantasy, slaveholders were on top. They were comfortable and they were safe. It's important to know that they really experienced their logic as coherent and that they vehemently believed that their way of life would go on in perpetuity right up till the end. But here's what enslaved people knew then and what historians know now. Those slaveholders were actually terrified and they should have been. Enslaved people knew themselves not to be property and found ways to nurture themselves and their kin, teaching each other to read and to write and to worship and to have hope. Enslaved people broke tools. They worked slowly. They told jokes at the expense of the people who owned them and also just to make each other laugh. Enslaved people took up the tools of their labor, axes and pitchforks, and revolted for freedom, or they took to the woods or the swamps or the river to make their way to Ohio or Massachusetts or Nova Scotia. Enslaved women tied to plantations because they were often caring for children or elders took off into the woods or into the swamps too, or hid in places inside the house, refusing to work until they could negotiate for more food or to end sexual pursuit or persecution against them or to not be sold away from their children. That is to say that slaveholders never perfected the art of owning other human beings. They never perfected the system of white supremacy. And all that time, while slaveholders were anxiously trying to make white supremacy work, enslaved people were studiously, constantly, vigilantly perfecting the art of survival. Here's where violence comes in. Violence was a fundamental condition of slavery. The white supremacist fantasy was quite fragile and it needed the strong arm of physical violence to take it beyond their dreams and bring it into the material world. Slaveholders and, de and their deputies used it constantly to realize their vision. But of course, the requirement of violence betrayed the white supremacists, for if their vision of slavery as a positive good had been true, violence would not have been necessary. The whip was not the main site of violence in slavery. The main site of violence in slavery was the daily grind, the daily torture, what literary theorist Christina Sharp calls the climate of fear. The whip was an aberration, but is a symbol of terror because it announced the enforcement of slaveholding fantasies. What is important to remember is that although that terror was literally felt in the bodies of enslaved people who bore the weight of the lash, it was also felt in the slaveholders' core, for to use the whip, to need the whip, was to betray the vision of white domination, to admit that an enslaved person had indeed resisted. Violence erupts then when the lie at the heart of the fantasy is laid bare. It is a reaction to that exposure and an attempt to make the fantasy once again. <laughs>
This is to say that the march on Charlottesville relies on several layered level, levels of memory, a memory that is at its root actually a fantasy. We might want to better understand how someone can have a memory of something that didn't exist, and we might want to understand how we can all have such different versions of the past. It is also to say that the eruption of violence at Charlottesville is not the sign of white supremacist strength, but rather it is the sign of white supremacist panic. That does not make it less dangerous, but it might remind us that they are not winning. Thank you. Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, President Paxton, for convening this stellar group of colleagues. I'm proud to participate in the conversation. Also to uh, the provost and Marissa Quinn for uh, bringing us all together. Um, actually, just arrived from Texas yesterday. I was uh, working and worked with a group of professors. We started a nonprofit that's called Refusing to Forget. Uh, that is working to commemorate the 100-year anniversary of a period of anti-Mexican violence on the Texas-Mexico borderlands. And it's, um, we're working to coordinate historical marker unveilings. And so I won't talk about that here, uh, but in the Q&A, you know, I think we should be asking not only what monuments we should take down or that we should correct or that we should engage with, but also which monuments we want to install. Uh, we are, how many of you are thinking about um, DACA and immigration? Okay, me too. Um, we are living in a moment, a uh, monumental time where we as a nation are at a crossroads. We can become the nation that continues to embrace white supremacists, xenophobic immigration policies, brutal policing policies, and that witnesses the repeal of civil rights like voting rights, uh, transgender rights, or we can become the nation that takes advantage of this opportunity in the moment um, that we create a moment that future historians will reflect on as the moment when Americans corrected our course of history and chose an alternative, more just path. The moments for opportunity to, to eliminate uh, white supremacy or racism and discrimination are often come in the wake of moments of racial violence, uh, but they increasingly come at the, at the behest and of the calls of civil rights activists that identify when white supremacy is, is rising. Um, history teaches us that there are grave consequences for not correcting the, white, the rise of white supremacy, namely, that it will continue to spread and be entrenched in our laws, policies, and daily life. And so today I want to think about the relationship between the rise in white nationalism and the promotion of anti-immigrant sentiment uh, and the practice of, of restricting the category of who belongs in the United States. And I want us to think about a moment in the early 20th century after World War I when you saw the re-entrenchment of white supremacy in law and policy. Uh, there were actually opportunities during World War I. Labor organizers were uh, participating in successfully gaining labor rights. Uh, civil rights activists uh, were protesting and mobilizing, especially the National Associ Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The NAACP was opening chapters across the country to protest uh, the, ex the expansion of lynchings of African Americans. Uh, in a state like Texas, for example, in 1919, there were 38 chapters of the National uh, Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and they were actively working to get governors and the President of the United States to pass anti-lynching legislation. At the same time, you had uh, Mexican-American civil rights activists that were police, that were protesting uh, the brutal policing of the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, it was a, it was a, a period of a rise of, of brutal uh, mob violence, but also police violence that targeted racial minorities. Uh, but to match that, there were civil rights gains uh, in, in making these acts of violence public. And so one example is that in 1919, Jose T. Canales was a state representative. He was the only Mexican-American uh, elected official in Texas, and he drew attention to the, the rampant practice of anti-Mexican violence at the hands of the state police. How many of you know who the Texas Rangers are? 
Okay, so they're not just a baseball team, but they're actually the state police of the, of the state of Texas. Uh, and they were, they were formed in the 19th century to police not only native bodies, uh, but black bodies and Mexican bodies. And by the early 20th century, they were charged by the governors of Texas, by sheriffs, by local politicians, and by the media to police Mexicans with brutality. Mexicans were being profiled by eugenicists in the early 20th century as an inferior race. Uh, they were being criminalized as inherently violent, and they were being profiled as bandits. So ethnic Mexicans in the early 20th century, especially during the period between 1910 and 1920, were being called, or they, were, they were being profiled as threats to American security, and they were being called, uh, the militarization of the border was being uh, called for by governors and local residents. And so you had a culture of impunity uh, in which governors, uh, local courts justified the murder of ethnic Mexicans, whether they were American citizens or Mexican nationals. Now, historians estimate that between 1910 and 1920, hundreds of ethnic Mexicans, if not thousands, were murdered uh, in collaboration between the Texas Rangers, uh, local police officers, US soldiers, and Anglo vigilantes. Now, in this investigation that Canales was successful in bringing to the state, uh, the Texas Rangers were found guilty of committing heinous crimes. Uh, one included the Bodavanid Massacre, which is one of the events that we have a historical marker unveiling um, coming to fruition next year. Uh, Texas Rangers collaborated in executing, massacring 15 men in the presence of their wives and children uh, in 1918 in West Texas in a small town called Bodavanid, and there were no prosecutions of those Texas Rangers. Um, and so the investigation exposed not only the collaboration of Texas Rangers with vigilantes to, to create a reign of terror, uh, but they exposed, this investigation exposed how the state was complicit. Uh, governors offered their pardoning power uh, for the racial profiling that was happening and the acts of racial violence. And, uh, and the investigating officers of these crimes also dismissed and justified the, the, the murders themselves. And so as a result, uh, the Texas governor, William P. Hobby, supported uh, the congressional decision not to prosecute any of the Texas Rangers. Instead, they reduced the force from over 1,000 Texas Rangers to just under 70. And instead of prosecuting the Texas Rangers that they had found guilty of committing uh, lynchings and massacres and murders in the name of securing the border, those Texas Rangers that were dismissed, like the, the one that organized the massacre in 1918, went on to become sheriffs, prison guards, and eventually they would uh, create the Border Patrol. They would be the architects of the, the US Border Patrol that was established in 1924. And so when you see uh, the opportunities, when you actually saw what the investigation did is that it created the opportunity for the governor, uh, William P. Hobby, to intervene in the violent uh, border policing that was ongoing. But instead what he did was he embraced it and actually charged the Texas Rangers to also dismantle uh, the efforts of the NAACP in Texas. And so by the end of, by 1920, the Texas Rangers uh, had helped to intimidate the NAACP chapters in Texas and reduced the chapters from 38 to just seven. And so, as a result, we saw the rise of white nationalism in Texas. Uh, the KKK had a resurgence in the 1920s. In 1923, excuse me, 1922, Texans elected a card-carrying member of the KKK to the U.S. Senate. The Texas State Historical Commission uh, made October 23rd of 1923 the KKK Day of Texas History uh, to be celebrated and commemorated, and that, uh, not only created the celebration and endorsement of white nationalism as a patriotic, uh, 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 as a, uh, excuse me, as a performance of patriotism, um, but it also created the systemic uh, sanctioning of, of border policing and the criminalization of immigrants. Now, I, I, in thinking about you know, those, the parallels between the pardoning of racial profiling and the anti-immigrant sentiment, in many ways we forget the connection between American, uh, between white nationalism and anti-immigrant sentiment because anti-immigrant sentiment and xenophobic immigration policies are sanctioned by the state. 
Uh, and so when we think about the repeal of DACA, we also need to think about the vulnerability that immigration policies have created uh, for immigrants that are trying to come into the United States. So when we think about immigration reform, we also need to pay attention to the fact that the, the four counties where we're having the historical marker unveilings also host detention centers. Right? So the ongoing practice of violent border policing and the exclusion and policing of immigrants is something that we're grappling with 100 years later. And the last thing that I'll say too is that when we think about um, who belongs in the United States, we also have to pay attention to the immigration policies that have been passed since the 1990s, since the, the, the installation of Operation Gatekeeper and Operation um, Hold the Line in the 1990s, 7,000 people have died trying to cross into the United States, right? And this is a humanitarian crisis that when we think about white nationalism um, and the participation of uh, making vulnerable lives that uh, are, are uh, mi minority lives, we have to consider not just uh, the acts of violence through rhetoric or uh, the policing of people that are in the United States, but the ways in which the nation makes actually uh, the border a, a place of violence and a place of death. So, um, you know, for me, Charlottesville helps us to disrupt popular assumptions that histories of violence are, are, uh, can be reconciled just with time, and that if we don't attend to them and intervene when, when white nationalism is called out and when white supremacy rears itself, uh, and especially when the state endorses it, uh, we, can, we can bet that there will be a rise in continued violence. So I'm so glad to be here and to, to participate in the conversation and hope that we can talk more about um, white nationalism and immigration and how it's affecting our, our, uh, our campus today. Thanks. So I'll, I'll add my voice to the chorus of thanking the folks who organized this. I also want to take a moment to thank everybody in the room for coming out on this first day of classes when I know the buzz of starting the semester is uh, keeping you really busy. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Um, I'm going to talk about two things in the minutes available to me. Um, the first, I want to address the question of why demonstrators chanted anti-Semitic lines like uh, Jews will not replace us uh, as part of this event. And uh, if I have time remaining at the end, I want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons of um, the history of anti-Semitism uh, and how it's been enacted from prior periods and what it can help us think about um, today. So at a rally ostensibly about protecting a statue of Robert E. Lee, asserting the legitimacy of white culture and white supremacy, and defending the legacy of the Confederacy, we had demonstrators, as we've heard, speaking uh, the, and chanting, Jews will not replace us. Um, this was a demonstration suffused with anti-black racism, but also with anti-Semitism. Marchers displayed swastikas on their banners and shouted slogans like blood and soil, a phrase which is drawn directly from Nazi ideology and prior uh, anti-Semitic ideologies before that time. So it's not actually common in the 21st century United States to see these two forms of racism so dramatically fused. Because um, structural racism in this country deeply affects the lives of black and brown people, um, but most Jews do not in fact face this kind of limitation on their lives in the housing market, in the educational world, in the criminal justice system, and in the occupational landscape. Um, these are all places where structural racism has really fundamentally undermined the lives of people of color. And while Jews were very much targeted by many of these forms of structural race racism in this country um, in the early parts of the 20th century, uh, by the middle of the century they had uh, reduced and in fact um, most of these forms that we associate now uh, with racism in this country have diminished for Jews uh, significantly and happily. So at the same time then it is easy to forget that anti-Semitism and anti-black racism are often closely entangled. Uh, and there are really two reasons for this that I want to underscore today. The first is from drawing on the works of historian David Nuremberg who has traced what is sometimes referred to, although he actually problematizes the history of the longest, what, what scholars have called the longest hatred, that is a form of um, anti-Jewish racism that dates back really to St. Paul and the birth of Christianity, uh, and then all the religions born from it. Um, 
and including Islam and then um, the secular philosophies of Europe that follow, many of which learned to think about their world in terms of overcoming the dangers of Judaism. And that's a direct quote from Nuremberg. Uh, these are not, this is not a timeless and linked form of hatred, but it is, it is a fact that over and over and over again in the history of our times, one of the ways majority societies have come to understand and think about difference is by focusing on uh, the Jews in their midst. And this uh, reiterates in times of conflict over and over again, and we see it uh, in Charlottesville. Um, but I think probably more importantly, the point I wanted to focus on is the history of 19th century European nationalism, when an ideology emerged that fused anti-Semitism and racialized imperialism in forms that distanced the white dominant European classes from what they viewed to be their racial inferiors. This is not to argue that uh, anti-Semitism and other forms of racism were identical. No historian uh, would ever make that kind of argument. But while historians have traditionally argued that, and traditionally I mean 20 years ago, you would have found a lot of works emphasizing the uniqueness of distinct forms of racism in the 19th century and the uniqueness of the Holocaust and the uniqueness of slavery, and you would have found a lot of scholarship emphasizing that. In recent years, scholars have really started to think much more about the ways in which anti-Semitism, colonialism, Islamophobia, uh, and colonial violence were actually all deeply rooted in a similar racial hierarchical formation um, that worked again to help uh, European nationalists and uh, the ideological frameworks of nation state building in the 19th century to distance uh, and, and hierarchicalize the different peoples in that world. Um, so like when, for Hitler, and when Hitler came to power, of course, um, we've come to know that for him, the world was seen in a racial hierarchy, uh, and white Nordic people top, were at the top of that racial hierarchy, followed by Slavs, blacks, and Arabs, and even lower Jews, who were believed to be the existential threat to the Aryan master race, uh, and were therefore at the bottom. Um, these, these beliefs, of course, became the government ideology uh, and were spread through propaganda and turned out to be um, extremely dangerous basis for the reordering of German and European society. The phrase blood and soil, which came out in the events we are talking about today, was an early Nazi slogan used in Germany to evoke the idea of a pure Aryan race uh, and the territory it wanted to conquer. The concept was foundational to Nazi ideology and its appeal, and blood referred to the goal of a racially pure Aryan people. Soil invoked a mystical vision of the special relationship between the Germanic people and their land, and a tool to justify the land seizures in Eastern Europe and the forced expulsion of local populations, all deemed to be racially inferior um, for, in favor of ethnic Germans. Um, but th this term was also a rallying cry in the 1920s and 30s before the Nazis had taken control. Um, and while anti-Semitism did not have the same kind of widespread violent support it did in Europe and the United States, bigotries against Jews was a common form uh, of a, a way in which white supremacist uh, ideology expressed itself in the United States, where Nazi groups here drew on tropes and themes uh, and ideological models that were articulated by the Nazis in the 1930s. For such uh, individuals in this country, being anti-Jewish and anti-black were clearly and obviously linked. Um, and that's why for rioters in Charlottesville who looked to Nazi ideology as the connection between um, African Americans and Jews is clear for them uh, because they have their roots in this form of hatred going back uh, in time. Um, I don't have much more time, so I want to just make one very brief concluding point, which is much of the scholarship on uh, anti-Semitism in Europe in the 1920s and 30s has focused on the concept, and here I'm drawing on one particular scholar, a woman named Marion Kaplan, who's written about this period, um, at, has focused on the concept of social death, and that what preceded uh, violent genocidal death in Europe was first the social death when neighbor turned on neighbor, boycotted the stores of their neighbors, turned away when somebody they had known and been friendly with previously uh, uh, 
was harassed in the street. Um, and I think one of the lessons of the history of anti-Semitism for us in our times is the call to us not to engage in this kind of turning away. And I, I think sessions like this are a powerful reminder that we are all uh, implicated in making sure that the society in which we live in is a socially just one for all. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for coming this evening. Which public monuments ought to be taken down? President Trump wants to focus our attention on that question. He does this by asking us to look down, down onto a slope that he claims is slippery. Robert E. Lee today, Stonewall Jackson tomorrow, who's next? George Washington. <laughs> I want to invite you to join me in considering a more powerful and a more positive question. This question requires that we look up and that we look up together. At this historical moment, what new public monuments should be erected? The purpose of a public monument is not merely to acknowledge our past. Instead, the selection of a monument is essentially a forward-looking activity. As my colleague Melvin Rogers remarked to me recently, when we think about monuments, we are deciding what events from our past should live on into our future. By the monuments we choose to erect, I suppose, we reveal the kind of community that we are. More importantly, we state publicly the type of community that we aspire to become. This is true of nations such as America. It is also true of institutions and universities such as Brown. So now I narrow my question. And in narrowing it, I direct it to you, the generation of students and faculty and administrators now at Brown. What new public monuments ought Brown to erect at this moment? Brown's history is both wondrous and terrible. What moments from Brown's history should we allow to live into our future? Which moments from our history should we honor precisely because they express the kind of university that we hope Brown could become. Allow me to propose a few. Uh, Inman Page is widely hailed as one of the first black graduates from Brown. There are two portraits of Page on campus that I know of, and an important organization bears his name. More significant, I think, is that in 1877, Page's classmates, most all of them white, elected Page to be their class orator. They did not choose Inman Page because he was black. Indeed, according to some accounts, they may have chosen Page despite the fact that he was black. Why did they choose him? They chose him because Inman Page was manifestly the greatest, most brilliant orator at Brown. At that moment, the Brown community affirmed their commitment to a precious and common ideal of university life. That idea, that ideal, is that we search out and we honor individual excellence wherever we find it. I hope Brown will consider erecting a statue to Inman Page in the act of oration. This would be a monument not simply to Page, not simply to his classmates. Rather, it would be a public statement of Brown's commitment 
to excellence, regardless of race. That is a, that is a new monument in Min Page, in the act of oration, that I think we could all get behind. There are other moments from Brown's history that I think might be worth commemorating. Some of these are controversial. Chris asked me to speak, so I'm going to just tell you what I think. In 1963, when Governor George Wallace visited campus to debate Brown students, there was an astonishing act of bravery by a black leader from our community. Time prevents me from saying, from going into it, we can discuss it later if you like. In 2013, when a group of angry students began shouting down an invited speaker, one brave student, this one white, turned and faced that angry crowd all by himself. And he noted that in silencing the speaker, they were silencing him too. My personal favorite, though, is from Convocation Day 2001, um, one of the, my favorite days on this university. Um, it was Ruth Simmons' first Convocation Address as President of Brown. Some might say that we should erect a monument to Ruth Simmons because she was Brown's first black president and the first in the Ivy League, perhaps. But I think the real reason that we should honor Simmons is because of values that she used her position as president to defend that day. Quote, while other types of communities devise covenants so as to avoid conflict, our covenant is rooted in quarrel, in opposition. We encourage ideas and opinions to collide in the service of learning. We freely trespass boundaries. We criticize each other's views, test every theory. No idea is beyond range or out of bounds." Close quote. This is a difficult and lofty vision of university life. A public monument perhaps a, pl a plaque bearing those words, the words that Ruth Simmons spoke that day, might help her vision live on into the future of Brown. Thank you. Good evening. How's everybody doing? You're holding up? It's been a tour de force up here of many disciplines and incredible insights. So let me see if I can speak in fewer than seven minutes. I actually have my own version of the clock, just in case. Um, I know everyone has thanked you, President Paxson, but I really want to thank you as well because this is an important conversation to have, particularly at the start of the year, uh, and I'm delighted to be a part of it uh, and participate. We, we really need to learn as much as we can about the deep and complex roots of white supremacy and how we got here, how we got to Charlottesville. And this is really the only way we can truly decide where, we're, where we will go from here. So this is an important beginning. And I've learned a whole lot from my colleagues today, so thank you all for that. I want to move us to the relatively uh, present moment and ask us some kind of hard questions about the reality of the world in which we live. Um, I want to make an opening statement which is the, the basis of the rest of my comments, which is that white supremacy is not a marginal or leftover fringe ideology in the United States, nor is it limited to the extremist displays and acts such as what we saw in Charlottesville. I'm going to say that one more time. White supremacy is not a marginal, leftover, fringe ideology in the United States, nor is it limited to the extremist displays and acts such as that we saw in Charlottesville. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because it's absolutely crucial that those of us who believe in racial justice, who understand ourselves as wanting to create a just and multiracial democracy, that we deal with the reality of 
the range of the performances of white supremacy and the institutionalization of it, not its only, only its extreme marginal ex expressions. And this is actually critically important, so I'm going to spend most of my time on this. I will say I also know it can't feel terribly comfortable. It doesn't, like, it's hard to say. I had to say it twice, so I'd make sure I didn't skim over it. Um, but it's very important that we confront that. If we don't, tremendous peril is in front of us. White supremacy is a core ideology of the founding and governance of the United States, and this has not been fully erased. It's not actually abated as much as contemporary conversations suggest. It's evolved and reduced in some important ways, but it's also reinforced itself in some ways in the last 30 to 40 years that were not the case before. Most importantly, the centrality of white supremacy as a way of understanding the world and normalizing significant, not just disparities, but institutional impediments, um, that the centrality of the obscuring of white supremacy is the heart of the problem we're in right now. One of the ways in which this uh, practice of, of supremacy has been obscured is by narrowing the range of what constitutes racism. So over the last 30 or 40 years, there's been an ever-contracting uh, space that one could call racist. So it's basically you have to be in the Charlottesville rally in, 19, in this year to be a racist or to believe in racist ideology or to support structures that produce racist outcomes, whatever the circumstances may be. And that has left the rest of us, presumably we don't have a tiki torch contingent in here, I'm just going to assume that at Brown for the moment but that may not be a safe assumption. But let's assume that it's true, um, that the rest of us are therefore not racist. So the system of the world in which we live is therefore not producing racist outcomes, and these are these fringe groups that if only we could somehow control and get rid of, the rest of the world would operate properly. In that moment, we make the gravest mistake, I would argue, and I would really encourage you to both challenge that kind of extremist white supremacy, but look more deeply in the, com in, in the world in which we live today. So that when we say this is not us, and we look with shock and horror, there is a moment in which I, I want to encourage you to say, well, actually, it is part of who we are. And the vestiges of that are everywhere, and the practices of it are all around us. In fact, most white supremacy is very civil, it's very polite. Uh, it's not in any way uh, as extreme and filled with hate speech as we, as we witnessed. Some historians have argued that the extremist wings of white supremacist thinking is actually the perfect cover for the more institutional ways that inequalities are generated and produced and hierarchies are constructed. So what do I mean by this? I'm just going to be a little bit more specific. Um, when we think of white supremacy, we focus very specifically on the language of white superiority, right? And that's what makes neo-Nazis and the KKK and other supremacist hate groups very visible, because they focus on the idea of su white supremacy and superiority. But if you look at the ideologies about race that dominate our culture and our political landscape long before Trump, so that's not you know, a helpful marker for this conversation, we find that it's about non-white inferiority that we learn about white supremacy. We learn that whites are superior by having constant conversation about the inferiority of black people, the inferiority of Mexican Americans and immigrants of color the inferiority of people of color generally. That's how we learn. We learn about their, their sort of penchant for crime, their lack of cultural interest in education. We learn about their inability to save money. We learn about et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All you know, highly normalized, often very scholarly and um, you know, uh, polite conversations that tell us who is superior. In, in, this, in these conversations, it's never that we start with superiority, but we establish the inferiority of everybody else. This goes on institutionally in mass incarceration, and I've been working on structural racism. I won't repeat this great detail here because I don't have much time, but when we have a, a significant level of systemic and structural impediment, past and present,
past unre unre unremediated and present reproduced. When we have that kind of condition and then we continue to discuss the outcomes as if it's a meritocracy, that's white supremacy. This is what we have to confront. You simply cannot make an argument that you have the level of structural impediments that are widely understood to be significant and real, and at the same time make the case that it's a meritocracy. That practice obscures structural constraint, makes us look only at hate as a form of racism, and reproduces a hierarchy around race that then gets understood as cultural and personal and specific. They work harder, they did a good job, they functioned as individuals. And this is basically group superiority um, that is institutionalized. So we're, we're involved in a collective practice that I want us to really attempt to stop. And this is true for all of us for in one degree or another. Patricia Williams, the critical legal studies scholar, has this phrase I adore called the transgressive refusal to know. And I, I love this phrase because it's not just that we don't know, it's that we, we do know, but we kind of don't want to know. And so we actively, you know, in a very kind of edgy, you know, challenging or compassionate way, refuse to know. And she talks about this, the kind of perpetual shock that people of color look around and think like, why is this shocking? And as in Professor Honig's display when the woman said, you know, this is, what are you talking about? We have this all the time. Sort of what world has been created, right? that you think this is exceptional? What, are we living in the same uh, universe? And so this, I want to involve you uh, in the practice of refusing this transgressive refusal to know and to, to turn this, la let this be like the last moment of shock and surprise, this circling back to how can this be who we are? Um, and it seems to me that um, we need to focus here at, at, on a campus in challenging our own curriculum to do a better job teaching us about race. Because I think it's a crime that we have such a crisis in this regard and higher education as a whole ultimately marginalizes this kind of conversation. And, and that's part of the crisis itself. Human exercises of unjust power and hate require our best and most determined selves. It requires that we refuse um, and that we refuse the exercise of unjust power and hate in our responses. And I, I want just very quickly to, to just partially close on how much anger and frustration and, and hate hate produces. It, it looks like the only way to, to win is to be more exclusionary, to be more angry and hateful than what comes to us. But, I would like us to think of a kind of prefigurative politics, that is to say that we behave according to the rules of the society we hope to create, not the one that we may be denying. This means being active and just and courageous and agents for change. I am in fact though um, angry and I'm sad about this and I want to say that because you know we're all scholars, we have a lot of big ideas and our brains are sort of crowded, um, but our hearts are our, my heart is, is, is unhappy, it's sad, it's, it's in pain. But I am determined not to let despair and anger rule me. The level of hate being supported by the halls of power in our society is at a very toxic level. But we cannot let it determine who we are or who we want to be. I believe, despite what I see right now, the power of the human spirit, and I always will, and I do believe deeply in the power of ideas to change the world for good. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of you. Those were just, just amazing, amazing remarks. Uh, there are some people I know who have to leave and go off and do other things, so thanks for coming. We, we have about 20, a little bit more than 20 minutes for Q&A, and I thought we would just go straight into it. Uh, so we have speakers on both sides, and it's a teach-in, which means you're here to ask questions and talk and get some discussion going up here. So please come forward. And we'll start on this side. Cool. Thanks. Can you say who you are? If, I can if you don't certainly mind? say who I Great, am. Great, thank Hi, you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is Aaron Mayer. I am where this is going to fall now. I'm rather tall. Um, I'm a senior. I'm studying philosophy, specifically moral philosophy and political theory. And 
I have a few questions, but I'll just start with this one. I believe in moral truths very much. I believe that white supremacy is wrong and neo-Nazism is, is wrong in the same way that two plus two is four is always right. I think that's very, very clear to me. And I also believe very much in free speech and the democratic ideals that this nation upholds. For instance, I may not agree with what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. I believe very strongly in the moral value of those ideals. However, I'm also the grandson of Holocaust survivors. My great, grand, my great aunts and uncles were all murdered in Auschwitz. So when I, I shudder at the rise of neo-Nazism and the resurgence of white supremacy, but I also shudder perhaps more so at the potential erosion of censorship and anti-free speech um, practices that perhaps could be a natural and perhaps righteous uh, response. So my question is, what are the means that we can take, legal or extra-legal, that demonstrate and repudiate our, uh, that demonstrate our hatred for hate groups uh, and repudiate their values while also upholding our ideals for free speech and the robustness that allows this country to thrive? Thank you. Thank you. So who wants to take that? It's a good question. Do these all work? Okay. Do you mind? Oh, you're still standing. That would be good. So maybe you could talk about, if you would, where you see free speech under assault right now. Because that's implicit and actually somewhat explicit in what you said. And I'm hearing this a lot. I often hear it a lot when usually there's other issues actually going on. Where do you see free speech erosions? Um, and are we really in a crisis of free speech? And I ask that question, I must confess, in a loaded way of, skeptic <laughs> I couldn't of, of, of skepticism. It reminds me a little bit of proposals to amend the Constitution to prohibit the burning of the American flag when there's no one burning American flags. That's an excellent rebuttal. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, it would mostly actually, I would say it's, it's evident, at least in my experience, from conversations with fellow Brown students and other friends be saying, when they, when they say, oh, how can we allow this to happen? Why don't we just prevent them from uh, uh, assembling in the first place? Or, or, or how can we, why don't we enforce more rigorous uh, hate speech laws that would, that would prevent this type of visceral verbal abuse? Um, so perhaps it's not being proposed or entertained in any serious legislative way. But certainly, that's what I, I mean, I would love to outlaw neo-Nazism right now. Uh, and I think many of us would perhaps feel that righteously. The question is, how can we, ta how can we express that extra-legally such that we don't erode those free speech laws? Can I? Thank you. Can John. I, so um, free speech is an epiphenomenon. What matters is how we think. And focusing on speech, I agree with Mike to some degree, I think, uh, it might be a mistake. It's obviously crucial to maintain norms of free speech, especially the ones of this university, which are not often spoken, but maybe should be spoken and affirmed. But much more important to me, and I think perhaps to you as well, if I understand you, is the question of what's the state of our thinking? How free are people thinking? What opportunities are we giving students at Brown, for example, to think new thoughts? How often are they challenged to see things in different ways from one another? How often do they encounter people in their classrooms and in their dorms and in their friendships who see the world in radically different ways than they do? Or how often do they find themselves living, thinking, talking, and breathing among people who share the same general outlook? So I think that's really the, the, that's the tough issue. At a university especially, it's the thinking and the quality of the thinking that we should be most concerned about. Do, does anybody else want to respond to that? Or we can move to the next question? No? OK, thank you. Thanks to both of you. Right here. Hello, uh, my name is Donnie Satlow. I am a junior studying religious studies. Um, and my question is directed at um, Dr. Mandel in particular. But as always, everyone is welcome to answer it. Um, in a recent statement put out by the Jewish community, um, several rabbinical organizations condemned the racism in Charlottesville and the anti-Semitism, except for two, uh, two rabbinical organizations who happen to be in the Orthodox community. 
Um, and it interests me, kind of this relationship between um, kind of Jewish Judaism and whiteness. Um, so my question is, how do you see this developing in the future? Do you see in the Jewish community Jews trying to pass as white and kind of you use the channels of power in order to continue this? Or do you see um, many members of the Jewish community trying to stand and fight for racial justice? Okay, thanks for the question. This is on? No? Can't tell. Yes? Can you hear me? No? Let me try a different one. I have many cho choices. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, so first I'll do the disclaimer of the historian, right? Hard to predict the future when your when uh, source of evidence is uh, decades in the past. Um, and context, in fact, in the sh future will shape the answer to that question. So I'm going to answer it by looking back rather than by looking forward, perhaps, as a way to shed light into your question. Um, whiteness is a social construction. Right? Race is a social construction. It's something we, we all study and learn at Brown. Um, and Jews' relationship to this thing you've called whiteness has shifted over time. Um, and one of the things I was trying to allude to in my comments when I spoke is there was a, certainly a time in American history when talking about structural racism and Jews would have made more sense than it makes now when we talk about racism in the United States. There's still anti-Semitism and bigotry. That was also a point I was making. Um, but some of the ways in which racism operates in this country now towards Jews is different than the way it operated in the past. And not surprisingly, therefore, Jews' responses to it have changed. So as the social construction of who they are shifts with changes over time and context and society, the ways in which Jews respond, and Jews are not, in fact, a community, right? There are multiplicities of responses and ways in which people encounter uh, structures and, and uh, attitudes. But, um, but, there, but those responses have shifted over time as well. So I think the easiest and probably the safest response to your question would be to say um, it could shift again, right? Uh, as, uh, as social constructions are never fixed in time um, and that could potentially shift again. Uh, in the world in which we live right now, um, it seems to me that um, the, uh, and this is to a different part, I think, of your question, that the alliances, in that or maybe this is a more um, ideologically hopeful thing I'm gonna say, that, uh, that um, working together to fight the forces that seek to undermine anybody in this society, to my, in my opinion, is the direction we should be headed. Uh, and that would certainly be my hope for the future. Um, but, uh, but the historical constructions that have shaped the past may have a, a, a stronger play in that. Thank you. Over here. Um, so my name is Emily. I am a sophomore concentrating in public health. And my question is, I think Charlottesville revealed very clearly that there's a pretty deep fracture in this country and there's a decent number of white supremacists in this country. And as a Jewish person and as an ally of the students of color on this campus and to the broader community, it was incredibly hurtful to me. But at the same time, I don't know what the solution is because we can't shun these people from society. So I suppose my question is, what is the way forward where we accept these people as fellow citizens but wholly reject their ideology? And I'm sorry, I know many of you are historians and you aren't big on future predictions. I don't know, Emily or Martina or somebody, Trisha? I'm just, um, I think yeah. my first thought about that is that um, is, a, is a, like a little bit of curiosity around what shunning these folks from society might look like. I'm not a fan of shunning in any regard. But I do think that we are encountering a moment um, in which white supremacist ideology and the people who espouse it um, are entering, as Professor Honig was talking about, the public sphere in a different kind of way than, say, 20 years ago. It's not to say that the white supremacy wasn't there then or that it wasn't manifested, as Professor Rose was talking about, in all kinds of systems other than in verbal articulations of hatred. But I do think that there's something, it was very striking to me to be in the middle of my summer and to turn on the television and to see people with swastikas and uh, KKK insignia marching into a town that I know, that I have visited many times, that I have friends who live and work in. Um, 
Those marches were, by the way, happening too, in, in places that didn't quite make the evening news in Providence. But um, I do think that we're, we are in a moment of a different kind of normalcy. And I think that um, there is an opportunity not to shun, but to say, this does not belong in our public sphere. This kind of vitriol does not belong in our public sphere. The people who espouse it, are, if, if and when they are willing to work toward equality and diversity and inclusion and the sort of ideals that we as, a, as, this, as this university culture, but I think also as the deeply troubled um, and problematic history of our nation sort of is down for. If they're willing to get into that, then great. That's, that's great, that's what we all ultimately want. But I don't think that we need to um, conflate that with an embrace of hateful speech in public spaces. Do you want to Can I also that? say something? Yes, I, you know, something that's really um, striking as a, as a historian of racial violence, you know, often when I'm writing or giving talks, I talk about the, the phenomenon of forgetting of the public forgetting of the atrocities of genocide, of racial violence, of lynchings, um, and the consequences that that has on the future, the, the world that we live in today. And what we're actually seeing now is that there's a very public nostalgia for a return to periods of extreme violence um, that we have to figure out how, how to grapple with. Um, and, and in many cases, it's because we haven't as a nation reckoned with histories of slavery, history of, of colonization, histories of, of native genocide in a constructive way so that people can think about the lessons of the past and not recreate them. Um, and, you know, the curiosity that I have about these groups and, and what it means to shun them also is that we have to uh, realize that they are, are already members of the community. Right? And they could be police officers, or they could be loan officers, or they could be um, pr school principals. You know, I grew up in South Texas where Confederate flags and racial slurs were the norm. And people who espoused these racial slurs were in, in positions of power. And so when we think about these, these uh, you know, uh, members of fringe elements of society that converge in a public space, we also have to ask really important questions about what kind of work they do in their daily lives to affect people living in their communities. Um, and that kind of question of, of how we have dialogues with people to actually make social change, to actually have a more just world, uh, makes, you know, really recalls Professor Rowe's point that we can't think about people uh, with hate or that are espousing hate as fringe elements of society, but they are part of our society. And, and now with um, a sort of public resurgence of, of calls for a nostalgic past, um, uh, we have to really question you know, how we can push forward the conversation um, and, and not look back in a way that's, that's destructive to communities or that incites terror. Um, again, as we relived and re-debate you know, things like the Civil War. Um, and so, you know, the question, the curiosity, I think, is, is important, but we have to make sure um, that we're thinking critically about starting the conversations that we want to have that actually make the, the more just world. Thanks. Anybody else want to react to that? No? Right over here. Thanks. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, my name is Jessica, and uh, we've been at, at this panel talking about a lot of these issues at a, at a system level. Um, and I mean, this might sound cliche, but I realize that what often shapes these events uh, is a buildup of daily experiences, uh, frustration, angst, conversations, friendships. Um, like, change begins on a person-to-person -person level. Um, and the reason that these things are manifesting, I guess, at the system level is because things are awry when it comes to those person-to-person -person daily interactions. And so uh, my question is, I'm interested, um, of course, in moving forward. But practically, how is one to uh, navigate the desire to right these racial wrongs, um, frustration with others' transgressive refusal to know, with the belief that growth is possible, um, even, even with individuals who might frustrate very deeply um, in, in a non-self-righteous way, you know, in a non-condemning way? Um, is that clear? Yes. Tisha. That's Boy, that's a big one. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I guess I want to start where you began just a little bit with the idea that, you know, that individual dynamics sort of happen and then they create structures. You sort of started with the individual. And I guess I'm, I'm, I might want to suggest that 
it's a reciprocal project, that there is already a structure in which people have exchanges and that pre-produces certain structures and, as well as exchanges. So there might be, you know, more dynamic uh, interaction there, um, which I think is important for your other point about, you know, how we would go about dealing with it. I think it's very, we have a tendency in this society to think of very individualistically. And it's not to say that individuals don't do amazing things as individuals, but that our drive to hyper-focus on individuals obscures how those structures are actually playing out in every exchange, right, in, in ways that are bigger than who we are. So I guess my, my first piece of advice would be, um, you know, to, to think about how to be, to, to retain the, the spaces of open-heartedness, right, which, which are not places where you get <coughs> caught up in difficult conversations all the time, where you have to have sort of your own internal components, because it, it's pretty exhausting yeah. to, to manage this from near or far. Um, but the second thing, I think, is to, I mean, we're here at a, one of the premier universities in the world, and I think we need to use more of our intellectual capital, really unpacking, as I said, not just the category of race, but structures of racial hierarchy as they play out in the world in which we live. In our curriculum, we have that opportunity. I would say we haven't actually done our best with that, honestly, not here and not anywhere else that I know of, personally. It doesn't say it doesn't happen. Not saying they're not incredible minds working on it, but I would say that most of the of the trajectory of higher education has been into disciplines and methods that usually marginalize precisely this conversation, and it leaves that work on a small number of people. And I think that is really where we learn how our you know we can have these debates about a, a different points of view, but the topic itself needs to be at the heart of it. And it seems to me that fundamental literacy, which I think stems what Professor Martinez was talking about around the nostalgia, right, because our educational system has been just atrocious on this question. Look at any public school textbook on the history of African American history, just slavery alone, which should take up more than the five to six pages it usually takes up. And, you'll see, and the narrative, the political narrative that we're, we're actually educating the populace on these issues about is producing the kind of you know, righteous resentment and a misunderstanding of racial history that takes a very long time to overcome, if at all. So it's stoking the, the fuel of racial resentment through not just illiteracy, but you know, again, back to be the, the queen over here of white supremacy, but you know, that there's a kind of drive to, to reproduce itself through that means. So I think we, we have those kinds of tools at our disposal in an institution of higher education. That and an open heart, and I think, I think you'll be okay. Thank you, thanks a lot. Over here, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, my name is Patrick. Uh, I'm a junior in philosophy. And I wanted to kind of build on this line of questioning, in particular by asking what some of the proposed uh, ideal structural reforms would look like for upcoming generations. I think something that we've learned from the experience of like in particular mass incarceration is that ideas of what structural reform and institutional reform should look like are often ultimately deleterious or don't achieve their intended impact in various ways. For example, right, notions like colorblindness that were originally advanced to promote racial uh, justice uh, have actually become in many ways, ways in which things like mass incarceration are reinforced as Michelle Alexander documents, right? And so uh, I guess I wanna ask how upcoming structural reforms, uh, the kind of form that those reforms would take. In particular, there's like, I guess this kind of tension, right, between on the one hand, we wanna make it clear that we set an explicit public norm about inclusion and diversity in our public sphere. And at the same time, though, we do want to, I think, uh, reach out to people who have white nationalist leanings and try to have dialogues with them and understand, right, and make, uh, and I guess communicate so that they'll understand, right, kinds of the, um, the historical issues and normative issues that are motivating this position. So at the same time as we want to set an explicit public norm against their position, we also want to open lines of dialogue, I suppose, um, or maybe, maybe we don't, but that's also something worth discussing. Uh, and so I wonder what kinds of like institutional reforms we can take that would make uh, outcomes uh, ultimately align with, I guess, both of those priorities. Because in particular, uh, a lot of the institutional reforms we currently propose are kind of formal in nature, right? So how can we move from uh, formal prescriptions and in institutions to more substantive kinds of reforms? That's a really big question, and we have one minute to answer it. But no, I'm just, uh, would somebody like to, to just take a crack at that? Okay, 
This is not an answer to actual structural reform. This is an answer looking back to the past. But I think that one thing that we didn't talk that much about today, um, but that is really present in the conversation about who these groups are, right? These groups who we keep invoking, who the, who the men are who are marching in Charlottesville, um, is about class. And I think that um, when we think about white supremacy and the history of white supremacy in America, um, we would be remiss to not also think about the ways that moments of the resurgence of white supremacy are often moments um, of class conflict, um, in which it becomes very obvious that people of color and poor white people should stick together. And what has happened in various historical moments, and I'm thinking of one in the 18th century in particular, <laughs> but there are many, um, is that white supremacy as an ideology that is propagated by people at the top, wealthy white folks, right? Um, Slaveholders in the 18th and 19th century in particular, um, comes in to inject, and to inject into the situation and change the narrative so that it seems beneficial to people who, who have access to whiteness but not any capital that whiteness is gonna be the thing that allows them some social power even though everything else remains a mess. And so I do think that in terms of thinking structurally about the future, I'm not someone who thinks about the future. That's not my job. Um, that's not what I'm trained to do. But I do think that looking to the past, um, as Dean Mandel was saying, as a, as a lens on what could come might be helpful. And I do think that this sort of relationship between class warfare and racial warfare is, is very, very tight and tells us a lot about um, maybe not what kinds of structural things need to happen in the future to, to make changes, but certainly about the kind of ideological work that's happening to support white supremacist visions that allow these kinds of systems to, 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 to continue. Thank you. Uh, I, I think the ideal of uh, disagreeing and having the moral high ground, but also reaching out is a really great ideal. But I think we have to be realistic that reaching out to, let's say, the marchers at Charlottesville isn't going to do much good. That is, I, I don't, the, the idea of persuasion is a great ideal. Francis Wayland, one of the former presidents of Brown, believed that anyone could be persuaded. He spent many years trying to uh, persuade one of his friends who was a pro-slavery advocate, and it failed. And um, so one answer that's really quite boring, but incredibly important, has to do with voting reform. And what I think is the most important issue that actually deals with all of this, I mean, we can call it voter suppression, but it, which it is, uh, but it's other things too. The most important case facing the Supreme Court right now is redistricting for the sake of partisanship only. And of course, embedded in that is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You probably can't reach out to these people, but you can outvote them, but not now. Not as things stand. And uh, this is the issue of the day. You know, um, in the Warren court, Earl Warren said the most important issue of his day was Baker v. Carr and the other issues around districting and one, man, one person, one vote. Here we are again, many years later, and the Supreme Court is on the edge of, of doing this. I'm not sure what the answer is, but somewhere in there is an answer that's based on my idea, which sounds hostile, but after all, voting is a process and it's a democratic process. And we're not doing it well uh, in this country, to, to put it lightly. Uh, and embedded in it is white supremacy, obviously. Um, but other terrific uh, injustices of norms. Thank you. Thank you. So, so what I'd like to do, we have two very patient people. Why don't you both say your questions and then we can do one final run through and get some answers. So. Please. Hello, uh, my name is Hans and I'm a prospective uh, IR and economics major. Um, so my question uh, pertains to the Asian American community. Obviously there is a very uh, diverse amount of ideas within this community, ranging from the most vocal progressive to uh, those who view themselves as honorary members of the white nationalist movement. Um, However, there's also a very, very large segment of this community, I feel, that is more or less apathetic to the current um, happenings within the United States regarding uh, racial issues. And I was just wondering how, uh, if they should, the Asian American community uh, can become more involved in this national discussion and take action. Thank you. And over here. Hi. Um so I, 
I was interested in what Professor Tomasi was saying about like creating new monuments, and it sort of reminded me of the sort of title of this series, reaffirming university values. And as we're talking about, you know, it's not just fringe groups, but it's our friends and it's our neighbors. And so I was wondering about like because um, it's really easy to to look outward and criticize others, but you know, it's a lot harder to to criticize oneself. And I was wondering if you know, as a panel, like I think it's the fact that we're having this panel is a testament to what Brown can do, but I think um, it would be really valuable if, you know, we could look internally as well and think about like ways um, that were built off of slavery, yes, the, the fact that at some point, you know, this land, um, you know, had indigenous ownership and, and, and ways in which that's changed and like on the day of my convocation, which was a few days, or I guess yesterday, um, there was a protest and you know it was acknowledged, but it would be really great if that could be acknowledged here. Um, you know, Brown said that they've been working with the tribe to come up with a resolution. Um, but like look at the institution that this is. Like we have a huge amount of privilege, a huge amount of power, and that's something that, you know, lots of marginalized communities um, especially people whose land has been taken away from them have not been afforded. And so I was just wondering, like, what are ways that, like, as we move forward, we can think about our own community and how we move forward with negotiations or, um, you know, anything, anything related to that, but, like, acknowledging the position of power that we do have as an institution. Thank you. So two final questions. and. Happy to hear your responses. So I'm just going to say, I think there's an, a sort of a similarity to your question about Asian Americans and the question uh, that I was asked earlier about Jews, which is there's an assumption, assumption I wish and hope is true, which is that people who have in the past at some point suffered uh, their own um, oppressions or indignities uh, by definition should step up uh, and support other people, even if they themselves are not currently in that position. And, that actually the Asian population is so diverse that even what I just said is not factually accurate, right? Because there's plenty of racism directed uh, at Asian Americans and other Asian groups as well. But I still think there's a core here, which is, you know, how, how do people step up and support each other, which is what we're being at, what both of you in some ways were asking. Um, and, you know, there's, I mean, the, there's sort of a very, very obvious answer at some level, which is kind of goes back to, I think, something that Professor Rose has really challenged the whole room to keep thinking about, which is the ways in which our everyday experiences, each one of us, participate, not, not the rioters in Charlottesville, but every one of us every day, and it really speaks to the other question too, participate in structures and um, settings and engagements with other people where we are shaped by the structures we're, we're in, so where we actually perpetuate some of the very structures, so Asian, well, Asian Americans experience this, Jewish Americans experience this, affluent students at Brown University experience this, even if they come from diverse backgrounds, we all participate in engaging the structures in which we're in, and in some cases sustaining problematic structures, right? So, I, I mean, I'm gonna say something very dean of the college right now, but, but wearing that hat, I would say, you have this tremendous opportunity in front of you to learn, uh, and to think about how your own choices as individuals help sustain and perpetuate these, these structures. Um, and I, my own very kind of simplistic ideological view is we have to start with ourselves, actually, and work to make sure we do no harm, and then work to work with the people around us to make the world a better place. And it's, it's a kind of a super idealistic, simplistic way to end that comment. Um, but ultimately, I don't think one of us is going to go out and change how Asian Americans respond, right, or how Jewish Americans respond. But we can, we, can, we can do what we can in this world to make that change happen. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to respond? Why don't I just say a few words? I think the question about how Brown is dealing with um, the the issue with the Poconocets right now is really important. And I mentioned it in convocation a bit, but I can say a little bit more. Um, for those of you who are new, I think it was one year ago we started the Native and Indigenous Studies Initiative. And you know we've really been working with faculty who are experts in this area, Native faculty, uh, to uh, 
develop uh, our ability to teach and, and study and do research on issues that are important in Native and Indigenous um, uh, uh, studies, and at the same time create better and stronger links to the Native community in Rhode Island, in New England. And you know, we've made, we've made some good progress. We still have a lot more to do, but we have made some good progress. What we're doing right now is, is working, and it's kind of quiet, it's a little behind the scenes, but we really are trying to work very sincerely uh, to develop a response that works for the encamped group that's there in Bristol, but also that works for the other groups who, for whom this land is spiritually significant. And that's complicated. It's, it's nuanced, it's tricky, uh, it's not as simple good and bad story, uh, and I think it's one that we can work through. It, it's hard, uh, but at the end of the day, we really want to do the right thing here, and we will. So I, I'm glad, where did the woman go who answered? Yeah, thank you for, for asking the question. I really appreciate that, it's good. So we are at the end now. Uh, I, I'm not gonna begin to sum up, and we're 10 minutes over where we should have been, but I, I wanna say a few things, one is, I love this idea about transgressive refusals to know, right? And this is what we need to re reject here. We're at a university, we're here to learn, we're not here to refuse to know. And the fact that all of you came out on the first day of classes to start to dig into this very complicated set of issues, it's really important. So I wanna thank all of you for doing that. Uh, I think we're starting to have the discussions about what kind of country do we want to have here, and, and you can extend this discussion to countries around the globe, right? Racism doesn't end at the borders of America. Uh, but we're also starting to have a discussion about what kind of campus do we, want to, do we want to be, and what kind of community we want to be. And I look forward to participating with all of you in that conversation. I want to thank Marissa Quinn for organizing this, for uh, Provost Rick Locke for co-hosting, and especially all of the panelists for speaking tonight. Thank you.